All right, so far in this section, we've come a pretty long way. We've discussed the technical details of post hartree fock models. We've actually discussed the technical details of the hartree fock model as concerns basis sets. We've talked about how to get from molecular calculations to thermodynamic quantities for ensembles of molecules. And so I'm finally ready to talk about how do all these post hartree fock wave function theory models do? And I'll just remind you of a prior slide that had sort of a price performance comparison. And I won't recapitulate the entire thing. I'll just mention that kind of in order of quality MP2 was sort of your cheapest best option and coupled cluster singles doubles with perturbative triples CCS usually just pronounced CCSDT because so people actually use the full triples that even though it's parentheses you just say T uh, that's the gold standard option if you can afford it so now let's actually look at atomization energies so that's a, a non a controversial test set in some sense. You can uh, compare heats of formation to uh, of molecules to heats of formation of atoms and that defines the atomization energy. So that is both experimentally uh, accessible as well as computationally using the approach I uh, mentioned in the last video. So the ideal gas rigid rotator quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator approach in order to get at all the ensemble contributions to enthalpy. So here's the hartree fock model. This is a decent basis set, 6311 plus G 3DF2P. So six primitives in the core, split valence, and it's triple split valence, three primitives in the tightest function, one primitive in the middle function, one, I shouldn't really call it a primitive at that point, it's just one function in the middle, one function that's loose, diffuse functions, 3D functions on heavy atoms, 1F function, and 2P functions on light atoms. Mean unsigned error on a fairly large test set, 211.5 kcals per mole. Largest error, 582.2 kcals per mole. So those are huge, enormous errors associated with the hartree fock level. There's no electron correlation there. I'm going to ignore that because it's density functional theory, and we're going to talk about that in our next uh, unit in this course. Instead, I'm going to talk about MP2. So remember, this was kind of the next step up, still the same basis set. The mean unsigned error has dropped from 211 kcals per mole to 10. So you got a factor of 20 improvement in accuracy, and the maximum errors dropped to about 25. That also a little better than a factor of 20. And the cost of this calculation is not uh, terribly extensive. So it was, that was certainly a worthwhile improvement in accuracy. Now we'll go to QCISD, so remember I told you this is a little bit like coupled cluster uh, in terms of how it is accomplished. It, it is size extensive, that's what the Q does. And here on a certain test set, and I've got various here because different people benchmarked on different sets, but roughly these are all comparable numbers. For 109 molecules, the mean unsigned error is 51.7 kcals per mole. And you look at this and you think to yourself, hey, wait a minute. You told me QCISD was a better level of theory than MP2, but MP2 had 10 kcals per mole, and QCISD is 52. There's something wrong there. Well, what's wrong there is that for these 109 molecules, in order to apply this level of theory, a relatively small basis set had to be adopted because the calculations were otherwise too expensive. So this is a very good basis set. This is a you know, reasonable but not particularly good basis set. And because correlated levels of theory are much more sensitive to basis set incompleteness, that leads to substantial errors, and that's unfortunate. So a word to the wise, don't do really expensive calculations with bad basis sets because it's just a waste of time. So that's just emphasizing the problem here is really the basis set, not the theoretical model. Here is a couple cluster singles, doubles, parentheses, T. Oh halfway decent basis set. It's lacking the diffuse function. It's only got 2Ds instead of 3Ds, unlike this MP2 calculation. It was only possible to do it for 32 different molecules, and it gives you roughly similar error to the MP2 calculation. So were you able to improve this basis set, you would expect better performance, but uh, that can be a pricey undertaking. So 
all these theories in their uh, construction, if you like, the really advanced theories are wonderful, but they give disastrous thermochemistry if you can't afford to use the best possible basis sets. So what to do about that? Well, one thing that's been explored is so-called multi-level protocols. So we know that a non-infinite basis set leads to errors, and for different levels of theory, uh, we, we actually even know the way in which that error accumulates. So if we know that, you can in principle extrapolate to infinite basis by looking at the behavior with a few different calculations, I should say different basis sets at the same level of theory. And so in particular, if you'd like to know that Hartree-Fock energy for the infinite basis set, what you can actually do is compute the Hartree-Fock energy for a given basis set where these x and y values give you some indication of the valence split. So x might be 2, say, for a split valence double zeta, and 3 for triple zeta. And remember, you'd want to keep it balanced, so as I extend the split, I also add in higher polarization functions, d, f, g, and so on. And you can show that when you do that, you ought to be able to extrapolate according to this sort of equation, and that will make up for the basis set incompleteness of having to just stop at some level. And uh, I, I guess in this case, I'm, I'm emphasizing again that you're adding these higher angular momenta as you're going to better split. So d is 2, f is 3, and so forth. Correlation energy schemes, turns out uh, for MP2 in particular, you can show that this equation is true. For other correlation uh, schemes, you don't necessarily uh, derive from first principles a nice uh, extrapolating equation, but you can certainly fit empirically to some sort of extrapolation. Notice by virtue of third powers appearing here instead of fifths, this is actually more slowly uh, reaching convergence, but if you can get enough points, of course, you can fit a curve and get an estimate. So uh, a multi-level protocol may go beyond that too. Rather than attempting in some rigorous way to extrapolate to an infinite basis set, instead you can empirically optimize the way in which you add together different components of a calculation in order to achieve your best estimate for total energy. And so just to give you a feel for that, uh, you know, expressed as an equation that says we've got some multi-level energy that derives from a series of component energies that are multiplied by prefactors. If, uh, you know, if we were doing something terribly exact, all the factors would be one as we did really high level calculations with really big basis sets. But if we can't afford to do those, maybe these will start to vary from one. And so just as an example, you might do an MP2 optimization of a structure using a valence double zeta basis set. And then you might decide that you are going to improve that energy by doing a single point calculation, because you can't afford to optimize the geometry, using a valence triple zeta basis set with augmenting functions as well, and you don't want to double count anything, so you would subtract the MP2 double zeta basis set calculation. So this is the additional correlation energy associated with the bigger basis set compared to the smaller. And then maybe you'd want to look at the effects of MP4 compared to MP2, and so you do an MP4 calculation and again subtract the MP2. And maybe you think CCSD parenthesis T will give you something that MP4 doesn't. And so you would take a difference there using the same basis set and so on. So it's up to you how you'd like to construct this. But the idea is you keep trying to get additional components at the most efficient way that you can. And you may indeed end up with some empirical terms that uh, you derive by looking at a large data set. And uh, thermochemical contributions are, may also be included in here. This is E, but if I now want to get to H, I'm going to have to get frequencies from some level of theory. I'm going to uh, use partition functions from a given level of theory. Maybe I want to scale those. Well, there's a lot of these multi-level protocols. I've called this the menagerie. There are so-called purely additive protocols, and the names they go by are G2, G3, G2MP2, and these names attempt to tell you something about where did the geometries come from, where do the frequencies come from, are they more appropriate for radicals, that's what G3RAD is, and you really just have to go look at the original paper to see exactly how they're put together. 
There are extrapolative protocols in addition to additive. And so uh, some of the popular ones are called CBS, that stands for Complete Basis Set. And then the dash, dash four, dash Q, little Q, dash capital Q, that tends to be giving you some indication of what sort of uh, correlated levels were being used along the way. There are the W for Weizmann, the Weizmann Institute in Israel, where they were developed, levels of theory which extrapolate to infinite basis set for various components and then add on other components. And, and once more, you just have to go look up what these are because uh, it gets hard at some point to chunk it all into an acronym. There are scaled additive uh, protocols. And so uh, this is the case where you will optimize some scaling coefficients. So scaling all correlation is SAC. MC is multi-coefficient G3. Uh, these were developed actually primarily by Don Trular's group here at the University of Minnesota. And then uh, after the initial uh, MCs were developed here, others also explored them within the context of uh, other levels of theory and, and other places. And finally, there are so-called bond correcting protocols. So accepting that whatever approach you use will have some sort of transferable error, perhaps, for uh, having certain kinds of bonds in your molecule. And uh, BAC, back bond additivity correction, MP4, is an example of this. And we already, in fact, saw in some sense at the semi-empirical level, these pairwise distance-directed Gaussian models, they really adopt the usual semi-empirical approach of massaging the potential energy surface by putting in little attractive Gaussians or repulsive Gaussians along the way. And that could be viewed as a bond correction protocol. How do they do? Well, here was sort of our, our, the easy bar to get over. You want to beat Hartree-Fock theory, which is absolutely horrific. And remember that MP2 whacked down the error by a factor of about 20. So here is the complete basis set uh, dash Q flavor. And you see that you, you get about another factor of 10 improvement in the error and about a factor of three here. There's still a, a reasonably large outlier in the maximum error. But that's certainly a, a useful improvement. The G3 level of theory, uh, which is starting to become relatively expensive, but same order of uh, accuracy. W2, that's the Wiseman level of theory, that now on a 55 molecule test set, uh, where it's actually quite expensive to apply, so these are not huge molecules necessarily, but it does achieve a mean unsigned error of a half a kilocalorie per mole. And so you'll often hear theoreticians talk about chemical accuracy. Does a model have chemical accuracy? And that's defined to mean on a atomization energy test set, do you do better than one kcal per mole? So chemical accuracy is one kcal. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about spectroscopic accuracy, and that's where you would like energies accurate to one wave number. Usually that's not necessarily, say, an enthalpy, but instead it's uh, accuracy in spectroscopic constants. But in any case, just so if, if you see that term, now you know what that is. Uh, and the maximum error also gets knocked way down. So W2 does better with some of the more exotic molecules down to a 2 kcal per mole max. Very expensive, though. So having arrived at the pinnacle of wave function theory, post hartree fock calculations, let's take a step back and ask, what's the right way to do a calculation? So best way, solve the Schrodinger equation exactly do full CI in an infinite basis. And while this gets green font because it's just the right way to do it, you get the right answer for the right reason, you almost never can. So rarely practical. Next, try a multi-level approach to get as close as you can to that exact solution. So you're going to extrapolate, you might use an empirical correction, but your goal is to get the most bang for your computational buck. Next, use an isodesmic protocol to foster error cancellation. And so you can look in the textbook to get more details on isodesmic calculations, but in effect, it is a way to do the calculation taking advantage of some experimental data that you will assume provides transferable corrections to an analogous system in which you are interested. And uh, step four, in a sense, is, is very much along those lines. Assume error transferability between related known and unknown systems at an affordable level. So here it might not be energies we're talking about. Maybe we'd be talking about 
vibrational frequencies, and you will learn more about how to compute those at some point, soon as a matter of fact, but maybe you've got a level of theory that's convenient and you've observed that it always underpredicts ketone stretching frequencies, CO stretches by 40 wave numbers. And so you go and you apply it to an unknown molecule, naturally you'll probably add 40 to whatever your calculation is in order to have a best estimate for what you'd expect to see experimentally. Next down, and we're starting to get to amber colored font here because it's starting to be a little worrisome, uh, you might be interested in a property that nobody's measured, so you do a calculation, but somebody has measured a different property for that system, and you figure if your calculation does okay on the measured one, it'll probably do okay on the unmeasured one. So that's a, a means to validate the level of theory. And then here's the bad way to do a calculation. Just pick a random method off the shelf and indulge in optimism and hope. So every once in a while you get that one by a referee, not too frequently it turns out, but really uh, armed with all the knowledge you now have about the nature of computational levels and their performance, hopefully no one taking this class will ever employ that particular approach for uh, accomplishing a calculation. Okay, so we have reached the end of sort of the technical and benchmarking bits of the Hartree-Fock theory and post-Hartree-Fock theory. I've got a couple more videos that are going to round out this section of the course and they're going to focus on the computation of properties other than the energy on which we've really been mostly focused up to this point as well as looking at the details associated with systems that have unpaired electrons. To date we've really kind of focused our discussion on closed shell molecules, the sort of average everyday put them in a jar in the organic laboratory uh, kind of molecules. But many molecules are very interesting that have unpaired electrons, so-called open shell systems, and they introduce some uh, aspects that uh, we need to consider. And so we'll be looking at those soon.